tonight we've got three speakers. We've never had three speakers in one night before. And each one of them has a very different perspective, a very different background, and a very different set of skills that they bring to a common interest. We're going to hear from Mary Jo Eggerston first. She is the founder and president of Echo Art in South Florida. Mary Jo Eggerston has a PhD in art history and I think archaeology. Lucy Keshevars is both an artist and an art organizational person in many, many ways. And Jesse Edelson is a teacher and an artist and discovered Echo Art and fell in love. So, welcome. And you're on. <laughs> Just a little background. Um, I moved to South Florida about 10 years ago. And uh, when I arrived here between the two big hurricanes of the year, Jean and Francis, or Francis and Jean, I guess, I couldn't do anything because all the contractors that were working on my house to renovate my house were fixing their own roofs. So I had a lot of time left over to consider the situation. We had been snowbirds, and I had never seen South Florida in the summer. So I was very shocked to see what we very rarely see because of the beautiful surfaces here. You know, there's a lot of beautiful surface, and we like to call it paradise. But underneath the surface, there's a lot going on, and it's not good. And it comes to the surface in the summer, and I think some of you probably know about the activism that's beginning to uh, emerge up in Martin County and over on the west coast on the Gulf about the releases from the lake. Well, when I moved here, I became aware of that immediately because there were articles about it every day in the paper. So the fact that it's taken people so long to get active, I'm not sure exactly why that is, but I'm pleased that that, has, that is now at least happening. Um, so. I became aware of what was under the surface, under the beautiful surface of our paradise here, because it comes to the surface in the summer in, in spades. And as a new person to the area, fairly new, and with all sorts of art background, I had been wondering what I would do with my PhD and blah, blah, blah. And um, I had thought I would work down at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Lake Worth, curating uh, contemporary art shows. but very shortly within a few weeks after I got here, it went south, it didn't happen, and a combination of being concerned about what's under the surface of our beautiful surface and being very aware of uh, a worldwide movement called ecological art, or eco-art for short, I decided I would start looking around for some artists that might be working in this way here in South Florida. And to my chagrin, I didn't find anybody. This was 2004. It wasn't until 2007 when in, and I kept, and believe me, I'm an art historian, so I'm a researcher, right? If I was going to find an artist that was doing this, I would find it, but there was nobody. So in 2007, um, in desperation, I invited a colleague from Berlin to come here to do some education. So Hildegard Court came, and actually Lucy and I connected around that visit in 2007. And as Hildegard was leaving, after having been here for two and a half weeks, she said to me, you must start an NGO. And I said, I don't want to start one. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Uh, that's not why I came to Florida. And she said, no, you must, you must. So that was really the beginning of EcoArt South Florida. And just about that time, I discovered that there was, in fact, an eco-art project in West Palm Beach, of all things. Top right hand, uh, I don't know how many of you, how many of you have seen um, this work in, in Dreher Park? Okay, if you haven't seen it, please go and take a look. Um, by the time I saw it and had been in, in touch with Lucy, who was the public art consultant on the project, it was part of a huge a redo of Dreher Park, and um, by the time I saw it, it was in terrible condition. There had been damage from the hurricanes, there had been trees had gone down and knocked down all sorts of things, and the sculpture that you see there, which was supposed to clean water, was not working because the pump had been allowed to get broken and not 
be fixed. And so it was, it was in pretty bad shape. So Lucy and I began to work on getting that fixed. And we started a grassroots organization. To do that, it took five years. So as of 2012, it's kind of fixed. But one of the things that I wanted to come back to as we go through this is the whole issue of maintenance of eco art projects. Because again, you know, if, it's, if we're going to change the purpose of our parks, which I really think we need to do, we need to be thinking about our parks in ways that are not just places to go for picnics and go for uh, playing soccer or tennis. We need to be thinking about them as ways to clean our air, to clean our water, and to bring beneficial wildlife back into the urban setting. So if that's going to happen, then the people who are in charge of cleaning our water, creating energy for the community and so forth, need to take responsibility for taking care of these artworks that are actually benefiting the parks. And then down here is the most recent work. But Lucy's going to talk about that a little more when she comes on. This is Lucy's project from last year, just completed last year. Uh, fascinating project. So 2007 to 2012, 2012. Lucy actually, I think she'll tell you, kind of became interested in making the art herself as a result of the work that we did um, on, on Dreher Park. So these are both. Um, Michael Singer projects. Michael Singer is a very fam internationally famous artist, did the waterfront. I don't know if you all realize that the West Palm Beach waterfront is an eco art project. It's not described that way on any of the signs. In fact, Michael Singer isn't even mentioned as having been the designer on any of the signage. It's really quite shocking that um, the work is not considered to be an art project at all. Up in the top is the living uh, dock on the right, and then there's a, that's a detail of the living dock. If you have you all been out there to see the living dock, that's actually a a living uh, oyster reef, so that people can actually see how oysters clean the water. Down below is the most recent project by Michael Singer. I'm really pleased that Eco Art South Florida had a role in making this happen at the Seminole Casino at Coconut Creek. If you haven't been out to the casino. Going there for this purpose would be a great thing, um, even if you don't like to gamble. They have some pretty good restaurants there, too. But you should definitely go and see it. This actually cleans about 500 gallons of water an hour. And it's either piped in from the retention pond that's nearby, or it comes from off the roof. It is powered by a 23 kilowatt hour uh, solar array on the roof. And it is cleaned via the air as it comes down. And also, there is a pond right at the base that also has plants in it, so it's naturally cleaned water. Also, more uh, Michael Singer projects. The uh, waterfront at Lake Worth was his design up at the top. And down below is his latest project, which is not completed yet. These are some renditions of what the visitor center is going to look like at the Solid Waste Authority, new Solid Waste Authority project out there. So again, Michael Singer, we're so lucky to have him here, but he doesn't get the respect as an artist that he should get. These two are Jesse Edelson. Jesse will be talking more about these later. At the top is a wonderful project out in Belle Glade that he did last summer. I'm so pleased because one of the things that happened as a result of that is it was never completed because it was just a demonstration area. But now we, we hear that it has actually encouraged the college out there to consider using it as a learning center for the five campuses of Palm Beach State College. So this is the kind of thing that can happen with EcoArt. It kind of gets arms and legs and can spur new, new kinds of things. Down below is a project he did with a dry detention area to create an outdoor classroom uh, for Boys and Girls Club in Stewart. And uh, these projects are all Xavier Cortada from Miami. Xavier started working as an eco-artist um, back in about 2006, so about a year before I had learned of his existence. And uh, he actually didn't call himself an eco-artist, but he does now. These three projects, the top two are reforestation projects. The top one is 
reforestation of mangroves, which he's doing all over Florida now, not just in Miami. And then the next one down is canopy restoration in Miami, which desperately needs it. And then at the bottom is his most recent project, fabulous project, in which Florida artists have been selected to each do a portrait of a, a Florida wildflower that was here when the Spanish arrived. So it's, a, it's a, an anniversary of the 500th anniversary of the, quote, discovery of Florida by the Spanish. And um, one of the things that's nice about it is it's a little bit ironic because he's talking about flowers that are no longer here, that were here in 500 years ago but are no longer here. And then in addition to that, there are also wildflower gardens that are being planted at uh, schools and libraries all across Florida as a result of that. These are the projects that are going to be in our film and uh, we have decided that we are, we have now as a result of all these projects have arrived at a critical mass of eco art projects across South Florida and so we want to document that and make sure that we let everybody know in a very um, graphic and exciting way what EcoArt can actually do to help the environment and to educate. This is the trailer, by the way, just a couple of minutes. I'm Mary Jo Augerston. I'm the founder and president of EcoArt South Florida. We started the project really back in 2007 when it became clear to me as a new resident of Florida that we were actually living in a very endangered location. Uh, we know that worldwide, not just in Florida or in the United States, but worldwide, science, politics, and law run the environmental movement. We're on site right here at the first, the very first eco-art project that was done in South Florida. Nature has a really good opportunity here to to become whole again and it seemed to me that it was time for art to take its place in making that happen. We're here in Westgate CRA and this is the Babbling Brook. What we've done here is we've created a, a habitat. Had we not done Babbling Brook there it would simply be a dry detention area. It's really necessary for the ponds to be something other than a kind of cesspool of pollutants it, to clean it so that it can then become uh, an actual uh, ecosystem. Water is the major theme. Water is what is most important, both the fresh water and the salt water that surrounds us. We were in an airplane looking down. It was a clear day. And we look down at the waterways of Florida and how they snake. They have this beautiful, graceful snake that happens as the water flows with the low topography. We thought, that's something we need to do in Babbling Brook. So what we believe is that artists bring that vision, that sense of imagination to the task of changing culture. And one of the ways that artists have always, over many, many millennia, been able to do that uh, is actually to create the vision, to show what is possible, to make the invisible visible. So many artists are working at the local level to help raise awareness about changing the function of our parks, about changing the function. Like Jackie Bruckner and Angelo Ciotti, Xavier Cortada, Lucy Keshavars, and Michael Singer. People may not know it's eco-art, but they look at it immediately and know that it's beneficial. It's very important with eco-art to have the community involvement. An artist, an individual artist, even a small group of artists, even a large group of artists, can't affect that huge problem that we have about moving to a, a cleaner and more effective uh, energy source, but we can show by our actions and by our working together with uh, scientists, engineers, and architects how this could be done. 
And very often, that is one of the first ways that change begins to happen. Okay, so that's, that's the uh, trailer for the film, and we will be profiling 12 projects, 6 artists uh, for the film, so watch for it, and if you want to help, we'd love to have some contributions. We need about $50,000 to do the project. Um, we've raised about almost, quite, almost 10,000, so we still have quite a ways to go. We're going to try to do it in little spurts, but as you can imagine, filmmakers don't really like to do that. It's really hard for them to get their group together and then disperse them and then get them back together and then disperse them. So we're and we want to take advantage of the good weather because our good weather is coming up, you know, starting the 1st of December. So the more money we can pull together to to do at least to do the film the filming part of it while we don't have to dodge raindrops, um, then you know we can keep raising the money as we go along to do the actual editing. So, thank you, Mary Jo. My name's Lucy Keshavars, and um, one of the things I thought Mary Jo was gonna cover, and I'll just quickly tell you the criteria of eco-art. It, it remediates or stops damage to the environment. That's number one criteria. Number two, it's site-specific. Because in order to do number one, you have to have it site specific. Number three, it, you, it's collaborative. As an artist, I do not have the knowledge, the scientific knowledge, the engineering knowledge, the architectural knowledge to do the work. So I have to collaborate with other people. And again, it's very site specific as to who you are going to collaborate with. And number four, maybe most important, what you were just saying is that you have to have community participation somehow. Again, how that happens depends on the project and the site. So this was really hard for me to come up with this for this particular, because Ellie said, I want this from the artist perspective, not from the engineering perspective. <laughs> the kind of work that I do is very much in the design world. And I work with engineers, so it was a little hard for me, but I, I managed. And so I started analyzing myself and thought, who am I as an artist? And somebody asked me, why do you do what you do one time? And I said, well, because I see things that others miss. And I want to capture these ideas and concepts to accentuate their meaning. Now, that's very broad, and I'll bring it down. But as an artist, I love creating. But beautiful objects for me are not enough. These are some of my objects. Um, photography, sculpture, clay. Photography for me is my two-dimensional work. I don't have the patience to paint or do that kind of work. This is an example <coughs> of integrated public art. This is not eco art, however. So this is just some examples of of what I have done. So I work in clay. This is site specific. I brought in stone and pilings and decking <coughs> because it referred to the history of Boynton Beach, which was part of what we were working on. So um, I'm all over the place. I want everything. This I just threw, I pulled off of my resume. You know, if you just look at this, I'm all over the place. I start, my Bachelor of Fine Arts is in theater, technical production, costuming, lighting and set design. I started out as acting and directing. I sang and danced and wanted to do all of that, right? But I figured I could feed myself better with uh, technical. And then I gave it all up, got married, and started having babies. So those are, so we talk about my jobs. So I went into floral design, ornamental plants, had children, helped my husband open his engineering firm, which, by the way, he's a very wonderful individual. And another big, broad part of my life is he's from Iran. So I have just this amazing everything. I wanted everything. It seems like I'm getting everything. So as a young artist in an older life, because that's where I am right now, everything, I relate to everything around me. But everything is part of my reservoir, yet it never seems to be enough. I think that. 
I don't know another profession that is so thin-skinned, vulnerable, and encompassing. Um, it's no wonder non-artists have a difficult and so often a derogatory view of artists. I believe it is also why the non-artist gets dreamy-eyed and perhaps intimidated by the successful artist. No matter what role I am in or idea I am trying to explain whatever I am doing, conceptual or hands-on, I first have to get a visual of it, always. My mind never leaves work, and I am so often in conflict with what am I doing and what I should be doing. Does that sound familiar, artists? <laughs> and the only exceptions are when I'm with my family, which is a big part of my creation, actually, my creative person, and when I'm on the construction site on one of my projects. That's when I'm happiest. So I wanted to talk about the artist's role in eco-art collaboration. Although the artist may be, and this is particularly on my projects, they're very much design in the urban area so far, what I've worked on. <coughs> and your introduction, Ellie, was perfect because Jesse has a very different way of working and it's gonna be cool and I wanna work with you. Don't go to New York. <laughs> so, um, Artist acts as the artist, um, not as a designer, and is responsible for finding, leading, and keeping the vision. It's a huge responsibility, and for me, it starts with, I don't know, and you have to embrace the unknown. And so these are the concepts and tasks involved when I'm working on a project. And when I say embracing the unknown, in the design world, when somebody hires you, which could be a developer, it could be um, the CRA, you're working with other designers, and they're used to you coming in and saying, okay, we're gonna do this, this, and this, right? Because that's what designers do, that's what landscape designers do, that's what engineers do, that's what architects do. They have uh, a little style and a little toolbox, and they have these, these little things that they put in front of their clients and say, oh, we could do this, we could do this, it's like this, it's like that, it'll do this. Well, when I walk in and they ask me and I say, I don't know, you should see the look on their face. It's really funny. And I tell them, I said, look, you don't want me to know because if I'm standing here in front of you in your office and I'm telling you what I should do on your site, it's not about your site. So embracing the unknown is about finding out what you don't know in order to ask the questions to find out the answers and the no, okay? Mass in motion is a term I use and it probably has to do with the fact that I was in theater, that I did dance, and that when I think about making something, I think about its impact. How is it going to affect the people, the place? And so when you're working on these things, you, when you're coming up with ideas, you have to think mass in motion. I, I don't know how else to explain it, and maybe it'll be more understandable as you see the projects. Audience, constantly thinking about your audience. Again, it, it has to do with your site. Who's gonna use it? What's gonna happen? And constant reconciliation. Stay flexible, research, 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 and must collaborate with the experts specific to the needs of your project. So the first one we're going to talk about is Babbling Brook, which was in that little trailer. And my husband was the engineer for Westgate CRA, and um, he had this idea, maybe after 20 years of me hammering on him, that we need to collaborate. We need art everywhere. It doesn't have to be just sculpture, it can be functional, it can work, it can do all of these things and be aesthetic and inspire. So he brought me into this project he was working on in um, Westgate, and this is the whole Westgate. It's a very large area, uh, military, Okeechobee, Belvedere, and Florida Mango. So he brought me in and he thought they were working on the Central Lake, and the issue in Westgate CRA is flooding a quarter of the population is below the poverty line. So he thought maybe we can do some art in Central Lake. So we started, I said I, I need to again embrace the unknown. What's going on here? Need the big picture. 
here's like some of the projects they were doing, uh, looked at the master plan, research, uh, do a tour, question, listen, question, listen. So no surprise, the two major project the problems were stormwater and lack of stewardship. So stormwater was the imposition of the storage. It's either in people's houses, in the streets, or it's in ugly detention areas, which are eyesore. Lack of stewardship, when you have that kind of environment on a day-to-day -day basis, there's very little pride, very little motivation to change it, and there's a great deal of ignorance. So these are things that I have to address as an eco-artist. So the problem of the water became the solution. Use water and needed infrastructure, you know, pipes, dry detention, storm, all the things that an engineer would do. Use this as a means for community amenities that are aesthetically pleasing art, eco art, a physical and visual way to link the community, education, assist with bringing about a sense of stewardship. So this is where the central lake is going to go. And that's a, a pretty picture of it. So during this assessment, I said, I don't need to work on the central lake. You're going to put this beautiful lake in, and across the street, there's going to be a dry detention. That's 500 feet by 125 feet. This is an example of dry detentions. They're ucky, mucky holes in the ground. And this one was going to be a huge one. So we came up with the idea of the babbling brook. And now when I say we came up with the idea, it took months between the engineers, the landscape architect, and myself, we just kept brainstorming. And in the film, it mentions that we're in the plane one day. And I mean, we we're talking about rain gardens. We we're talking about all kinds of things. And then we're in the plane one day, and we see that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we hadn't named it Babbling Brook yet. As a result of what we did, we called it Babbling Brook. And one of the ideas that I had was while they were doing the stormwater lake, they actually had to buy some old homes in order to complete the central lake. And I thought, why can't we use this concrete? Oh, this great concrete. Yay. Crazy well, um, come to find out, the years that these houses were built, asbestos. So I couldn't use that. So I did research and found out where all the recycled concrete goes in the county. It's amazing. And uh, I went and did some research on that. And then um, we came up with the idea. The concept was to, in this dry detention area, and does that look like a dry detention area? No. I know it's an aerial view, but I mean, it looks totally different. So we're pumping water from the lake, which is over on that side. We're going to put it over here. We're going to make a fountain and have it go down, right? And I'm going to edge the brook in recycled concrete like nature would do boulders, but I'm doing it with recycled concrete. And then it's going to go back into the um, lake. And we're going to churn it as it goes. And then we're going to plant Florida native plants. Now, we're about at this point, And I still don't have that community participation part. And through a series of conversations and arguments and research on the internet, I discovered that Audubon of Florida has a program called Urban Oasis. And what that is, is we can't move all the people out and put all the habitat back in for the migrating birds. But if we could, yard by yard, neighborhood by neighborhood, get the plants, the vegetation back that feeds the birds. And that's called Urban Oasis. And Part of that is citizen scientists that go out into the community, bird watch, co collect data. And I thought, oh my god, that's it. So long story short, what was just supposed to be simple, uh, maybe a palette of five to 10 plants, which the landscape architect could handle, turned into a whole different thing. It had to be habitat now. So eventually it did happen. So here we have, we filter and aerate the central lake water. We reforest an urban area. We use native plants to attract migrating birds. We received urban oasis designation, which is very important for this blighted community that they have that badge now. And that's the source for the people to come together on. 
And then it's cutting edge and sex example for others. So um, this was just an early example of what we thought it would look like. But basically what we did is the Babbling Brook is like a skinny swimming pool. So it's gunite and then pebble tack and then it's edged with um, the slabs. So this is the process. I'm, I'm very hands on. That's the other thing is that this kind of work is not something you can put on a plan and expect the contractor to do. It won't happen. You have to be there and direct the whole thing. So we're laying out the brook. The brook has been poured. Now um, every stone <laughs> on this brook we laid together. I laid with the contractor. And then the retaining wall for the fountain area. And just more in the water, in the construction. And this is the end. This was after everything was planted. And this was about January, the beginning of January. So there's over 70 species of plants. There's six microhabitats because of the different elevation. There's different plants that are required for every elevation. This is just another shot. And we have life. It, it was amazing. We put the wildflowers in. Talk about plant it, they will come. Amazing. All the butterflies that are there. And, all, and of course, butterflies and caterpillars are very important to birds. So that was the reason that those are there. Now, second project. Very different. The other one was public. It was government. This one is private. Old Dixie Eco Walk at Seaborn Cove in Boynton Beach. Seaborn Cove is a um, multifamily development. They won all kinds of awards. And it's beautiful, but it looks like every other apartment um, upper end. It's a luxury apartment um, area. But it looks like everything else. How do you know it's green? How do you know there's, there's electric hookups in there? How do you know this? How do you, how do you know it's green? Well, you don't. And it's gated, so there's no touring through there. So um, Boynton Beach has a, a public art ordinance. They require, this is considered commercial. They require public art, and thanks to Mary Jo, working with the city and their green task force, eco art is on their books as art. So what the developers of Seaborn Cove had intended to do, they front federal, but behind is Old Dixie. And there's an easement of a quarter of a mile by 50 feet wide. And they said, oh, we're going to plant this with all kinds of pretty plants, and we don't have to do the art, right? Well, Debbie Coles Bay said, no, you do have to do the art. So eventually they found me, and they said, well, you know, eco art. They'd heard about eco art, and they said, how about her? And she said, yes. Yeah. So here they come to me, and again, what are we going to do? I don't know. Let's figure this out. And so this one was easier in that it was private. I was working with developers. I knew what my budget was. It was just easier than the other one. So basically, they were going to reforest this easement, but nobody would know what it was. Nobody would know it was natives. Nobody would know that Seaborn Cove did that. Nobody would know that it was a private public partnership between a developer and the city. So none of this would have been known. So what I did was connect the dots. I made the invisible visible. That's how long it is. And that is the landscape plan for the 50 foot by quarter of a mile. So what I did to connect all of this, and I only had a $65,000 budget, which sounds like a lot, but when you got to spread it out, it's not. And, and I have to get paid. So what we did was, OK, we have the habitat. So I started thinking, how can I connect the dots? And, and I, again, I didn't know the science. I had to find scientists locally and Gainesville, in Gainesville, to help me with just 
all the basic information on the butterflies and butterfly habitat and the names and what's this and what's that and get photographs because it's not easy to photograph butterflies. I, there was no way. I'd still be doing it today if I had to do it myself. So um, what I did is figure out what butterflies would probably come there and I got the outlines, just the outlines of the butterfly because as I was learning it I realized if I know the shape of the butterfly then I can identify it better and that was helpful. So, I, so there's outlines on the sidewalk there's custom made plant identifications, which I'll show you. They're, they're not just the little ones. They're really nice size and they can't get taken away because they're on cap rock. And so I use Florida cap rock and I made watering basins with them and bases for interpretive panels and the tiles. So these are the outlines and they are, let's see, if, it, if it's an inch, I made it a foot in the sidewalks. So that's what they look like on the sidewalk. And a lot of people ask me, why don't you color these? And I said, no, I don't want to color them. First of all, it would take up my whole budget. And I want people to have to work a little bit. You know, In education, it's better if people work at it. So those are the, that. And then the tiles have the common name, scientific name of the plants. But it also has, how does it benefit? And so. Um, wild lime um, is the host of three different butterflies. So on that one, that's that. And that's an example over there of what it turns out to look like. A uh, butterfly watering basi basin, that was something I learned in my research, that butterflies drink at the edges of ponds and streams. And they get their water, but by, while they're getting their water, they also get their minerals that they need, their essential minerals. And so that's there, and it's also talked about in the interpretive panels. Um, on an easement, you're not allowed to put benches. You cannot put any amenities, OK? But I can put rock sculptures and carve them, so if somebody wants to sit there, it's OK. So that's what we did. <laughs> so we got these big Florida cap rock. And um, I went to the quarry and I picked each one out. And then they have to uh, carve these things. So then I mark where I want it to carve. And, and you know, you can't take the photographs to show how beautiful it is. I hope you'll go down there and see. So I did five sets of large sculpture, five sets of small sculptures. And then there's five interpretive panels that are on the rock. And this is just some of the stuff they had to do for me while they're constructing this. They're such good guys. But it's just lush and beautiful. And this was two months ago. It's, it's even more gorgeous now. I mean, a lot of people walk and they don't notice, but they do notice it's a beautiful. It's kind of like what I said in the film. It's, they may not know it's eco art, but they know it's beneficial. And then there's more information when they want it. And it connects to the nearby scrub park, which was right behind. It also connects. It's a connection in the city's future Greenway Blue Way project. Um, there's a railroad there, but that this is Leatris, which you probably are familiar with Leatris. You get it in um, cut flowers all the time. It's starting to bloom. It's going to bloom in the fall. Um, I also did one of those QR codes on which I've never done before. And that's the thing about eco art. I mean, you're in undiscovered territory and you just have to say, okay, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. Research, research, research and see how it all fits. So there's a link to the city website and they're going to keep all the information up there. I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to, whenever I do these projects, I have this kind of matrix that I work with, this table. So I have all the plants, their scientific name, common name, what they benefit, how they, where they live, blah, blah, blah. And so that's going to be uploaded on the city website. And then this will be included in um, butterfly counts on an annual basis. And the people in Seaborn Cove love it. They love it. So. Those are my two projects. Those are examples. And then we can ask questions later. And I think it's time for Jesse. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, I grew up in South Florida in Martin County on the water. My grandparents um, were from upstate New York and they um, had spent uh, time in Florida as kids. And so when they retired, they first lived in Miami and then chose Martin County. My grandfather was an avid uh, boatsman and um, birder. A little bit about me uh, growing up as a kid. I didn't really like school too much. In fact, it was really painful for me. I was dyslexic and um, I didn't like to follow rules. And I spent most of my time um, on the playground uh, drawing animals. I continued that through high school and eventually um, realized I had to do something with my life. And so I went to art school and I chose to be an artist. There was something very attractive about that to me. And I went through art school pretty much making awkward art, art that was ugly and um, challenging because I thought that's, that was my purpose as an artist to um, freak people out. <laughs> um, so when I got to my, the end of my, uh, my college experience, Savannah College of Art and Design, they, they're like, well, you know, you chose painting, so you, you don't really care about making a living with art anyways. So here's a couple of professional development classes and go get a, you know, a real job or something. So that was, my, that, was, that was how I left art and art school. And, and um, I really didn't want to be an artist at that point. The only thing that I could ever do well. My mom started a school called Bridges Montessori in Martin County. And uh, I had worked there in aftercare. And uh, I needed a job. So she said, well, I need an art teacher. So for eight years, I was an art teacher. And I didn't make much art for myself. In fact, I pretty much hated art, which was a weird place to be. I did a lot of bad talking about my artist friends that you know had gone to New York City and become, you know, painters or sculptors or whatever. And I was in a I was in a state of real resistance, uh, needless to say. And then one day, I stumbled upon this book sitting on my grandmother's coffee table, and it was just sort of out of place because my grandmother's not the biggest artistic person. She was actually, she's mentioned in a couple feminist books, she was the first female vice president of Howard Johnson's um, in the 60s when women weren't doing that sort of thing. So here was this book sitting on her, uh, her coffee table and I read it and I'm not much of a reader either and it's, it's very, very artistic talk. I had to read each page three or four times to get what they were trying to say. But essentially what they were saying was that, that art has a very, very important function in our lives. And it's not just pretty things. It's not just um, decoration. That if you trace it back to primitive times, the artist was the magic maker. They were the healer. They were the, the bond, the, the, the bridge between all things. They, they created the universe. The artist had a central role in society. And um, through the years, if you look at different art movements, especially like the Renaissance, you can really see that. Um, artists collaborating with all the other important people in society to create society. And then you get to modernism, where th people start abstracting and, and, and changing the way we look at the world. And it's like, yeah, OK, that's cool. You know, we're you know, making some freaky art, you know, freaking people out, changing the way we think. And then after that, you know, we kind of get into pop art. And, and then what? <laughs> You know, and, and it's like that's kind. Of, I was like, yeah, then what? You know, and that was that. That was my experience in art school. It was like, okay, yeah, then what? Well, Susie Gavlik points out that then what is postmodernism, and postmodernism is an artist that's not separating themselves from society, like in modernism, which I'm the artist. I see things di differently. I'm going to change how you see the world, but an artist that takes a step back into society and says. I'm the artist. I'm here to make the world a better place. I'm here to fix things. And she gave a couple of really cool examples. Betsy Damon, Lynn Hall. Betsy uh, created a water uh, cleaning park in China that basically cleaned up a whole river. And it was a place where kids could come and play, like you know, in the fountains down in West Palm Beach. You know, it was, it was a real public interaction project. And also Lynn Hall, who was making raptor roosts out in Wyoming where uh, hawks were getting electrocuted by power lines. She worked with uh, the power company to build these things called raptor roosts where the birds would come and nest and, and not be electrocuted. Artists dealing with the real issues of our time, which are environmental issues, social issues, 
different uh, other artists working with sanitation. Um, Merle Achilles, who worked with uh, New York Sanitation, waste, alternative energy, um, habitat conservation, social restoration, community revitalization. All that stuff really perked my interest. And I said, you know, this is, this is why I was, wanted to be an artist. This is the type of work that I wanted to do. And I felt very inspired. Within two weeks, I got a call from one of my uh, students' parents saying, hey, there's a group of artists meeting in my house about something called eco art. I think you should be there. So it was, it was definitely, yes. Um, when I first got to the apprenticeship, our first site that we went to was an Audubon site in Four Rivers, the community that I grew up in. The, my grandparents had their first um, real house. To, I had spent many, um, you know, my whole childhood playing in the woods there. And we, 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 got, and we got in the boat and we started to roll down the river to go to our first eco art site. And I'm like, oh, cool, we're about to pass my old house. And the boat starts slowing down. They're like, we're here. I'm like, we're at my old house. They're like, yeah, this is the site. <laughs> So, although I didn't know too much about what the eco art apprenticeship was at that time, I felt like no matter what was going to happen through the apprenticeship, I was meant to be there. <laughs> and my first artistic response was this tree that I created from ceramic, and it was for a fundraiser that we were. Uh, it was called Have a Heart for Eco Art, and it was at a local uh, art collector's house. And uh, it never ended up getting picked up, but um, it really became the the new direction for me. And uh, as I was learning through the apprenticeship, um, some really cool stuff started happening. There's, um, there's Betsy Damon up there on the left. She was actually the, um, the mentor for the apprenticeship program. So already, I started to feel like I was getting back into the art world and that, that I was you know, working with really important people. And uh, the, the top right is us uh, creating eco, they call them eco arcs, which is essentially, it's a, it's a mangrove floating island. Mangroves clean water, and um, they're very, very necessary, especially in the coastal estuaries, because all those mangroves are meant to filter the water. And when you talk about dirty water and polluted estuaries, I mean, uh, oysters are really helpful, but once the salinity gets under a certain point, the oysters die, but the mangroves will, will last. So then we started experimenting with um, these mangrove floating islands, and this is at the Florida Oceanographic. Um, one of our other sites that we were able to do eco art. Through the apprenticeship, it was unclear for me what exactly I was going to be, type of eco art I was going to be doing, the type of eco artist I was going to be. So I was, I really uh, resonated with what you said about, I don't know, about saying, come, just being honest about the fact that you don't know anything. <laughs> and that's kind of what I did. And by the end of the apprenticeship, I really had an idea of what I was going to do. And, and part of that was a, a, a series of, of fortunate or unfortunate events rolled into one, uh, the, the process of the apprenticeship coming to completion. Um, at one point, I was so frustrated that I didn't know what I was going to be doing that I just said, I'm just going to make something. <laughs> <laughs> because these people are sitting around talking about numbers and charts, and I'm an artist, and I'm just going to make something. So I took some driftwood, and I wrapped some twine around it, and I went out to the back of the eco-art studio, and I stabbed it in the ground, and I said, OK, this is my contribution. <laughs> and when Betsy came back from New York, because she would visit us for a little bit and then go back to New York, um, do her thing up there, uh, she said, I have something for you. And she showed me that picture on the bottom right, which was an animal, a blue heron, little blue heron sitting on the sculpture that I had made. And in that moment, it kind of all made sense for me what my role in eco art was going to be, at least the start of it. And um, we finished up the apprenticeship with an exhibition. And that's a shot of a ceramic bird habitat that I created with the, in collaborating with the Audubon Society of Martin County, who had very, you know, they, they had a lot of uh, very specific dimensions and all that stuff about how birdhouses would look. And I said, well, can it look like this? No, 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 no. But, but by the end, um, we figured it out. And um, this, is a, this is a shot from the exhibition, which uh, pretty much at that point, I had been working with Betsy and MJ and talked to Lucy and back in the art world. And uh, I even connected to Lynn Hull, 
who was one of my favorite artists from the book. And it was like the fact that I was even talking to Lynn Hall, and I was in a, an eco art exhibition that's like the cutting edge of the art world. It was just, it was a real turning point in my life. And I was really, um, it, it was like, all right, this is, this is my life now. There's me about to install a ceramic screech owl habitat on the Audubon site, um, right next to the place I grew up. There's Lynn Hall um, and me. Right after the uh, exhibition, I got an uh, internship with Lynn Hall out in Colorado. And um, it was amazing to be out there with her and learn about her whole process, and learn about her life. You know, she, she's a pioneer in eco art. Back in the eight, uh, late 70s, when nobody knew what eco art was, she was doing eco art. And um, it's still a struggle for her to get these projects commissioned, get the grants. She's an amazing person. She invited me into her home for two months in Colorado and basically taught me everything that she knew. And she paid me, which she didn't have the money to do. And there's just, I mean, you, you couldn't ask for a better mentor, really. And uh, she's come and visit several times. And she's uh, consulted on pretty much all of my projects. And she's. Uh, you know, she's working on projects now that she's trying to get me included in, and uh, yeah. These are some projects that I did after I had my internship with her. I learned about all the ways that I could get community engaged, and as Lucy said, there's, there's a formula to eco art. You have to have community engagement. You have to restore something. It has to be educational, and there's got to be, it's got to be art. There has to be something about, there, you as the artist, that's your role as not only to direct all this social sculpture of all these different elements, but to make it art too. So I did a couple. Of, there's uh, a habitat structure which provides uh, shelter and uh, food and basically a meeting place for animals. And that's on the top left at the Boys and Girls Club. There's an event we did at Artie Gras. Which, which is great. People love the interactive quality of eco art, you know, especially at, at a, an event like an art fair, where they can come up and pick up a stick. You wouldn't be amazed at how many of these kids never picked up sticks before. You know, they got their iPads going 24/7, but they never they never built a fort in the woods. And as a teacher, you know, there are so many applications for this eco art stuff. Now I'm doing my workshops in, uh, with CCE in, in West Palm Beach. And you know, it's really taking the eco art to the heart of the community. You know, There's a, um, a high school uh, internship that I did. That's a water quality flash mob that the, the high school students actually, I told them what eco art was. And they, their job was to propose their own eco art projects. So some of the students came up with this water quality flash mob. There's all different types of art, performance art, visual arts, music. You know, And that's the thing is that, Eco art can facilitate all those different types of mediums. This is one of my favorite images. It's, it's something I can clearly say is art. You look at it, and you're like, OK, that's a bird nest. It's a, it's a cool, funky, vintage photo. But it's the first um, nesting um, birds that I had in one of my sculptures. And so it's a really, it's a really important image for me. And, and I think that it, it, it kind of captures the idea of eco art being very much art. You could see this in a museum or something like that in a, in a gallery show. You know. Through the apprenticeship, I really got in touch with the um, at-risk community of Martin County, which is called East Stewart. And it became, I just fell in love with the community. And it became the place where I wanted to do eco art the most in my town. And so this project I'm working on now is, uh, is called the uh, East Stewart Project. And it's basically. Uh, a hist it's a history project about the community, where, where the community comes from, the people in the community. Because for me, there's just something so much more interesting about East Stewart than the rich part of town. This, this community is like a time capsule. It holds the history of South Florida within it. But you can't just go into the town and, and get it. You have to meet all these people. And they become part of this, the eco art. They become the sculpture. you know. Also using the um, the highwaymen um, lo-fi aesthetic mm -hmm. in in doing these drawings. You know, there's something really important. There's something really amazing to me about things that are done by untrained artists. You know, so I tried to mimic that style with these. Um. Bill Glade, 
the heart of what many people consider the problem of South Florida, and there's the, the tremendous, tremendous amount of agriculture, people really point the finger at Belle Glade as being the problem. Um, but you know, if they say about pointing the finger, there's one finger pointed out and three pointed back at you. You know, so here's um, a couple of time lapse photos. There on the top right is us last year building the habitat sculptures. They're post high school students who had to qualify uh, for a workforce alliance program, which basically means they had to be like felons, they had to be pregnant. Um, they had all these qualifications that they had to to get to be to get this job. So, needless to say, you know they weren't the straight A students. And it was so funny because the first day I had them, I was like, you know, research eco art and 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 tell me what you think. Or it was the second day. What did you think of so far the eco art introduction? And I got the reports back in, in my email. I'm like, wow, these kids are so smart. They know th all this stuff about eco art. Oh my goodness. And I'm like. All right, now, 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 just, now just type me an email. And wouldn't you know it, they didn't match up. They basically just copy and pasted. So they're very resourceful. <laughs> but I knew it was going to be, it was gonna be a, a great experience. And, and I had 17 of them first. And I thought, well, I probably don't need all these guys. But I just I couldn't turn them away. So it was, it was a lot of fun. Very challenging, but a lot of fun. So here's the Eco Art Project itself which is on Torrey Island, which is like basically the first settled area in the glades. People lived on Torrey Island because it was the highest elevation before the dike was put into place and the whole area was drained. And uh, so it has a lot of historical significance. As you do an eco-art project, you have to figure out the history of a place and incorporate that into your project, the geography, the history, the science, all that stuff. So here's some, here as you see, it's just finished. And um, it, looks, it looks much better once it's had a chance to grow up a little bit. And I was recently uh, in the Martin County paper, and it, the, the title of the, the article was, Local Artist Completes Eco Art Project. And I was like, oh, completes. <laughs> Such a horrible way to describe eco art. Eco art's supposed to get better every year. It's supposed to grow. It's supposed to become more a part of the environment. It really does get better with age. And the idea of completing an eco-art project, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So it looks much better now to me. But that's a, convincing people that, that this is better than this is the challenge with eco-art. Here's the East Stewart project. I went back to East Stewart. I proposed an eco-art project in their retention area next to the Boys and Girls Club. The idea of converting retention ponds into eco-art projects is something that I feel very passionate about. It's not only a great thing to do for communities, but it's also how I believe we can deal with this water pollution issue. Um, there's Everywhere there's a road, there's a retention ditch. Everywhere there's a parking lot, there's a retention ditch. Everywhere there's a school, retention ditch, retention ditch, retention ditch. This area was once a wetland, and these retention ditches need to be our wetland. And that's the only way we're going to get out of this water pollution problem. You can make it an outdoor classroom. You can use signage like Lucy did in her projects to really highlight each one of these, the habitat structures, the native plants, the cleaning capacity of limestone. Most recently, um, there's been a lot of activism in Martin County around the water quality issues. It's really bad. We can't go in the water. Growing up in Martin County, being on the water as a kid, it's heartbreaking. When you watch the death tolls of the pelicans and the manatees and the um, dolphins with herpes, you don't know what to do. You, you just get really angry. And so many people are getting really angry. And it's been, though it's been happening for 50 years, <laughs> people are really starting to mobilize. And um, most recently, we've been, I'm one of the event organizers, we've been organizing these protests, these demonstrations to get national attention, because it's a political thing. You know, the solutions, the retention ditches, the STAs, the, the, the areas that clean the water, these are all scientifically proven. They know they work, but it's just a political thing. You know, so what we need is national attention. We need the whole country saying, it's not OK to have toxic water in Martin County or along <clears throat> the Indian River Lagoon that goes all the way from um, Vera Beach all the way down. I mean, you guys have the same problems down here that we have up there. The, you know, the water shouldn't be like this. We're going to continue to do these protests and 
incorporate EcoArt projects, demonst EcoArt demonstrations into them. That's what I'm doing currently. Here's one of my proposed plans. Everywhere that's blue is a STA detention area water cleaning marsh EcoArt project. Um, inside the lake itself are cleaning tree islands. Basically, the, the project in Belle Glade is a tree island formula for creating a tree line. It's got the, the, you know, the hammock on top, the transitional and the hydric uh, plants and habitat structures, sculptures, and basically just repeat that all throughout the center of the lake. The, the lake is only eight feet deep. It could easily be dredged and islands can be created. And then eco theme parks. People, I, I talk a lot about Disney as being one of the most uh, amazing artistic movements. I mean, for better or worse, it has really captured our culture. And uh, there's a way that we can, I don't want to say Disney-fy, but there's a way that we can make eco-art accessible to everyone. And Disney, there's something locked in the way Disney does things that we have to emulate. People want to go to theme parks, you know. The River Justice League is, is just to end on, a, on an artistic note. Um, I created this logo for the River Justice League with the mobilizers of the uh, protests and the demonstrations. And we're going to continue to keep doing that. And I hope that, um, that we will align not only the east and west coast, but also Florida, South Florida. And we're working together um, to do that. And so uh, that's my presentation. Yeah. <laughs>